I'm Jennifer Zinberg from Board Intelligence, and we specialize in board packs. So we live, breathe, eat, sleep the things. And over the last few years, we've worked with pretty much every imaginable type of organization that you can think of. So we've worked with the very, very large FTSEs, with the boards of the likes of uh, the National Grid, EasyJet, uh, lots of mining companies, uh, financial service firms, the likes of Friends Life, uh, through to uh, companies that are not listed, the likes of, say, a Network Rail, uh, or a National Trust, uh, National Audit Office, uh, about 11 or 12 of the ministerial boards and their board packs, uh, and also some much, much smaller companies. So private equity or venture capital owned businesses with turnovers of you know, sub 10 or sub 5 million. Um, so a really very large cross section of British businesses. And I was chatting to a couple of women just earlier over the drinks who were saying that one of the difficulties with board packs is you see your own, and you may even sit on two or three boards, maybe even four or five. But you, they're such highly uh, sensitive documents, they contain probably a company's most confidential information. And so it's very hard to know what good looks like, and let alone then how to close the gap to get there. So I hope that what I'll be able to share with you today will be a really good sense of what does good look like? Also, what does bad look like? And how can you close that gap? But before I go on to talk about any of that, I thought I'd start by sharing a little bit with you about why. Why do we even care? What's so important about a board pack? To explain that, I'm going to take you back to really the origins of the business that Board Intelligence is today. Now, the business was founded in 2002 as a limited company, but we pivoted, which is the trendy term for it, uh, makes it sound purposeful the way it was, but uh, around 2007-8. And, uh, and that all came from the experience that, that I had uh, around that time working with a very large uh, FTSE board. I was with the business that we were then, a strategy consultancy. Uh, I was taken on with my team to develop the strategy of this big FTSE 250, and they asked us if we'd join a couple of their board meetings. Now, this was a board of relevant and carefully selected experts. This was not a board of trophies. They had on their board kind of a dream team. There were some entrepreneurs. There were some uh, chief scientific, a chief scientific advisor to the British government at the time. There was a... Uh, a former ambassador uh, from, from Asia, uh, which was a key region for this business, uh, a really fantastically diverse and able and interesting board. And this business had some big strategic issues to grapple with, which is why we were there in the first place. But what I observed when I attended their board meeting was quite a surprise, because the conversation in the board meeting just didn't get to any of those strategic issues. Now, bear in mind, this was, as I said, 2007, 2008. It was the period when board directors were being pilloried in the press daily for you know, being asleep at the wheel, We've got the wrong people around our boardroom tables, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sure there was perhaps some truth in that. But what I was witnessing was a board that lacked nothing in skill or will, but that was not having a conversation about the things that mattered. Now, I looked around the table and I saw these very eminent, very able, very enthusiastic directors. I knew they were enthusiastic because I'd spoken to each of them at some length outside of the board meeting. And sat in front of each of them was this large tome, uh, what I learned was called the board pack. And this tome, a kind of telephone directory size, was stuffed full of last month, year to date, financials and operational detail. The board meeting began, they turned over page one, and through the remaining three, four hours, they worked their way through this pack. And the conversation mirrored the information. The information didn't enable a conversation about the things that mattered. The conversation was almost entirely backward looking, stuck in the weeds, dealing with the financials and the operational detail, as was the information set. And so that's when I saw that actually you can have the most fantastic board of directors, the most diverse, able, experienced board. But in the absence of the right information, they are blindfolded. Information enables the conversation that follows. And that's why we decided back then that we would reposition and set up a business that does nothing but specializes in making sure boards get access to relevant and readable information to enable focused, productive conversations in the boardroom about the things that matter. Now, the experience on this board turned out not to be unique at all. 
and the challenges that we were privy to pertaining to the information turned out to be really quite common. And they've summarized them here in three buckets. So board packs, at their worst, are full of blind spots. It's a blizzard, and it's a pain. So the blind spots, really much like I was describing there. You get a lot of financial operational detail, but what you don't get is much visibility of what's coming up. What are the big strategic issues? What's happening outside of the organization? Board packs are often incredibly introspective. You don't get a lot about the drivers of value. You get a lot about the financials, but not why and how and what next. When you ask a board, what are the things that really matter right now, and you cross-check that against the contents in the board pack, there's often quite a large gap. But it's a blizzard as well. So kind of oddly, at the one hand, it's not got enough of the right stuff in it. And on the other hand, it's way big already, often described as a data dump. It's very hard to see. You know, the phrase we hear on a daily basis, wood for the trees, needle in haystacks. Um, it's incredibly hard to see what really matters within the information set. And often you read the whole thing cover to cover, this giant tome, and you're left none the wiser. But the sheer size of them on its own is a problem. And we did some research a couple of years ago with the Judge Business School and found that the average size of a FTSE 100 board pack is 288 pages long. Now, they can be much, much larger than that as well. But if you were to read a 288 page board pack at speed reading pace without a coffee break, it would take you over nine hours. Now, it's just not feasible. We asked at the same time, how long do you spend reading your board pack? We asked the same uh, board members. And the answer we got back was three to four hours, basically a Sunday afternoon. So at best, they're skimming two thirds of it. And until you've read something, how do you know if you skimmed the right bit? So they are, frankly, you know, an obstacle to clear thinking, as one person described it to us, but simply too big. And they're a burden, a burden for everyone. They're a real pain for management. They take up hours of management time. There is value in board reporting for management. There is value in coming up for air, and as a management team, in preparing your board papers, thinking back to why are we doing the things that we're doing and you know, reconnecting with the, the strategic imperative of the, the things that they're working on when you can get quite lost in the detail as management. So board reporting can be a very healthy discipline for management as much as it can be when it's done well, a very useful tool for the board member. But it can also chew up more than its fair share of time, which board reporting frequently does. And it's a pain for the board member who's trying to wade through the stuff. And your time is precious. If there's one challenge that is universal to board members, it's that the scale of the job is that big and the time in which to discharge the duties is that big. Making more efficient use of your time, your reading time, your thinking time, and your time in the board meeting is critical. So that's what's wrong. So what does good look like? I'm going to go on to talk you through that a little more. I'm also, in, in the interest of time, going to try to uh, speak reasonably quickly. But if I do go too fast, please do tell me and I'll slow down. Now, the way we at Board Intelligence have gone about tackling these challenges over the years really began around 2007-8, as you might expect of a strategy consulting firm that entered this space. We approached it like a consultant would. So we took on big projects with large multinationals to develop with them a wholly bespoke new board pack <coughs> optimized for their business. But after we developed maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 board packs, we started to see a lot of common themes, certainly a lot of common challenges, and invariably a solution that worked at least 70, 80% well for one organization and then another, and we just had to then really optimize it for them. So what we do now is we offer two services. We offer a service that is a consultancy, so we offer bespoke advisory support to individual organizations. But we also provide organizations with the tools to do it themselves if they want to. So all of the templates and the models and methods that we use to help develop effective board packs, we now offer up to clients so that they can have effectively the consultancy without the consultants. And uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the principles that sit beneath this. So what are these principles, these methods, and these templates that sit within the board intelligence approach to effective board reporting? Now, there are four blocks of color there, and I'm just going to take you through the, the fundamentals beneath each block. The first block is probably the most critical. And this is probably the reason, what I'm about to reveal, the reason this step is, or the fact that this first step is often not one that is 
followed is probably the reason why board packs are often a perennial problem. A lot of organizations at some point in their recent past will have had a go at tackling the problem of the board pack. Invariably, that initiative will have resulted in a board pack that's just yet yeah, bigger. And maybe a few years later, they'll have another stab at it and it'll probably just get a little bit bigger again. And the reason for that is because you can't start to fix the problem of the board pack by starting with the board pack. You've got to shove the board pack out of the way. The right place to start is by first identifying what is the conversation that you want to be having in the boardroom. The information is merely the enabler to that. So until you're clear exactly what the conversations are that matter right now for your board, you're not yet ready to prepare your board pack. Now, there's no point, as you know well, in having a series of superbly crafted board papers about things that don't really matter very much. And so that's why step one has to be developing a really effective agenda. Are we focused on the things that matter? Are we commissioning papers about the things that matter to enable conversations that matter? So that's where I'm going to start. And I'm going to share a little bit with you about how do you do that? Because it's a very, a very easy thing to say. You know, uh, in the benefit of hindsight, it's really easy to know what mattered. But from where you are today, how can you, again, in the very limited time that boards have to do all of the work that they do, how can you, as a board, do a little bit more thinking on this to make sure you're giving yourself the best chance of focusing on what matters. Then how can you make sure that the papers that you're receiving are really supportive of those conversations that you want to be having? So how do you make sure your papers stimulate productive conversations in response to a really focused agenda? How can you then help make it a little easier for your management team to prepare better papers? And finally, for some Actually, I was chatting with somebody earlier who said they've, they've gone for paperless board reporting, or at least part of their organization now has paperless board reporting. Uh, you can reduce the administrative burden for management, some of the administrative burden associated with board reporting by going digital. It saves management a lot of time, and it starts to reposition governance away from being an administrative chore to the thing that helps propel an organization forwards. So cutting away at all of the all of the nonsense admin around governance is always a, a healthy thing. And there are some other benefits as well to you as board members, which I'll come on to. So first of all, effective agendas. So you want your agenda to focus on what matters. Well, how do you work out what really matters? So we use a, a model that we've developed called the six conversations model. And what this model does is provides a framework within which, or a way of, I suppose, deconstructing the question of what matters into a number of smaller questions that are a little easier to engage with. So boards have two principal roles to perform. We group them into the steering and the supervising. So a board is there to steer the organization, so to help build the business of tomorrow from the business of today. But the board is also there in a supervisory capacity to seek assurance and to provide a check and balance to make sure that what is being done in the business is what they expect and agreed would be done and that it's being done in the right way. Now, boards need to steer and supervise across six quite different themes. Firstly, or three quite different themes, I should say, which gives you your six conversations. So theme one is strategy. So the steering of the strategy is the question boards engage with, which is, do we have the right strategy? And what is the business we want to become? And how are we going to get there? So the supervision of that is, never mind whether we've agreed the strategy, but are we implementing it as planned? Is it working? Steering of performance is to say, well, how can we work smarter? Actually, I've got a bigger one of this, apologies. And the supervision of performance is to say, well, are we going to hit our targets this year? And if we're off track a bit, are we confident we're going to get back on track? Steering of governance is to say, well, what culture and policies do we need for this business? What's the right way to do business for this business? And the supervision of governance is answering the question, well, are we working in the right way? If we've decided what it means to work in the right way in this business, are we living and breathing that every day from top to bottom of our organization? So ask yourself as a board, which of these six conversations really matter to you right now? And in what proportions? I mean, they'll all matter a little bit. But where should your board be waiting its time right now? Should your board be waiting its time right now evenly across all six conversations? Or should you be skewed a little bit in any particular direction? 
And within each of those six conversations, what are the specific priorities that really matter to your board because they matter to your business right now? So it's a useful way of deconstructing the incredibly large and somewhat complex role of a board member into six discrete units that you can more readily make sense of and have a meaningful conversation about as a board to agree together what matters and where you need to be spending your time right now. Once you're aligned on that, then you can start to think, well, now what information are we going to need to enable that? In the absence of doing this, what you tend to find is that board packs are stuffed full of information that sits in conversation five. You know, are we on plan, oh, sorry, are we on uh, target to hit uh, this year's results? A huge amount of outcomes reporting, you know, financials. Not much often on the drivers, but with the emergence of balanced scorecards, you know, increasingly more on the drivers. In a financial service firm, at least a huge amount in the governance block, at least so far as it relates to compliance, perhaps less on the culture piece, but certainly a lot on the compliance reporting. So conversations five and six, or those two topics, tend to be where the information sits in the ball pack, and that tends to be where the conversation sits. But if by design you agree where you want the conversation to be weighted, you can then reweight the information flow to help support that. So what does that mean in practice? What does a good paper look like that's going to support any one of those conversations? We actually take quite a different approach to the papers that are trying to support or trying to enable a steering style of conversation, distinct from the papers that are trying to help the board supervise and seek assurance. They're two quite different atmospheres in the room, if you like, that you're trying to conjure up. And, uh, and the papers have quite a different job to do. And so we take quite a different approach. But for now, I'm just going to share with you probably the most fundamental principle that sits across all of the board paper templates. And the most fundamental principle is that it all comes down to what are the questions on the mind of the reader, or the questions that should be on the mind of the reader, in relation to the topic that you're writing about. So again, someone I was speaking to earlier said that one of the problems with their board papers was it tends to be just whatever data is most readily available. That's what you get. And if they happen to have a lot of information on a particular topic, you get all of it because we've got it. You can have it, even though it may address one of the questions on your mind. But there are four others that get completely ignored. So starting not with the information available, but with the questions on the mind of your reader, that way you then supply information that is demand-led information, not supply-led information. And as the author of a board paper, if you're not really sure what question is on the mind of your reader, because you haven't really been given a clear brief, or because you don't really know the context that led to the paper you're being asked to prepare, then you're not yet ready to write your paper, which is quite often the case. So what do I mean by questions? I'll give you a couple of very simple examples. So a CEO's report. CEO's reports take all forms. We've seen everything from a very detailed inventory of everything that the CEO has done in the month since they last met the board, pretty much every conference they've attended, meetings they've been to, and a kind of, you know, literally the calendar, pretty much, uh, showing the board how busy they've been. We've seen CEO's reports that go into immense detail on operational performance and really somewhat repeat what you get in the next paper from the finance director and from your ops director, you know, giving you all of the detail you could ever want on the numbers. We've seen CEOs reports that talk about some big strategic things, which makes sense, the big strategic projects, because the CFO is going to deal with the numbers and with the short-term performance. But the reality is, every non-exec we've ever spoken to, when we've asked them, what do you want from your CEO's report, it doesn't matter the company or the context. We always get the same answer. What they say is, I want to know what's on their mind. That's what I want to know from my CEO's report. I want to know the detail of what's happened and why from the other reports I'll get in my board pack. But the number one question I want to know from the CEO is what's on their mind. And when you unpack that a little bit more, they want to know, looking back, what went well, what didn't go well, why were we doing about it, and what are they thinking about? Looking forwards, what are the risks or the concerns that are keeping them awake at night? What are the opportunities that they're chewing on? And net-net, where does this leave us? Is the CEO feeling confident or feeling concerned that we're going to meet our targets? And are they feeling that we have the right plan or that we need to adapt the plan? Those are the questions that they want to know. 
And if a CEO of any business serves up the answers to those questions, they'll have a very happy, or at least almost irrespective, actually, of the nature of the answers to those questions, even if it's bad news, they'll actually have a happy board member because the board member feels they can, they can trust their CEO to tell it as it is, to give them the insights that the board needs to help discharge their duties. Now, a proposal paper, uh, again, you know, dealing with a multitude of different situations as a proposal paper would. But again, the questions are often pretty common questions. You can't read the detail there, so I'll just share with you the kinds of questions that are common to all, all good proposal papers. But if you just leave it to chance, if you just ask someone to prepare a paper with no guidance, you have to try and tease out the answers to the following questions. And you may find the information isn't there to be teased out. You want to know what is the need or opportunity that has triggered this business case or this proposal to be prepared? Why now? And how material is it? And how does it link, if it links, with our overall strategy and aims? You want to know what options did we consider and against what criteria? We sit in board meetings with most of the organizations that we uh, are engaged by to do the big strategic, uh, to the big consulting advisory projects. And the number of board meetings we sat in where large chunks of the discussion get chewed up by non-execs asking, well, did you think about this option? Did you think about this option? To which the executive's answer is invariably, yes, we did. But they just didn't put any of those options into the board paper. The board is served up with really a binary decision, you know, it's, it, or binary option. It's this is the only option, or it's, it's kind of a back me or sack me each time. And the options aren't, aren't anywhere to be seen. All board papers, papers that are presenting a proposal need to present the options they considered, including, if relevant, the option of doing nothing. You want to know the option that is the recommended option of management. You want to know the risks associated with that and their thoughts and response. You want to know what needs to happen next and what the implications would be of implementation in terms of the resources that would be required and the approvals that are going to be asked of you later down the line if you say yes. And you want to know what would be the impact of a delay in taking this decision. Those are the questions you want answered, almost irrespective of what the actual underlying proposal is about. So helping your management team to get clearer on the questions that sit beneath the papers they're being asked to prepare will vastly improve the odds of you having the questions in your mind satisfied <coughs> ahead of the board meeting. And the more you can satisfy the questions in your mind before the board meeting, the more you can use the board meeting to progress the understanding of the board together in meaningful discussion and debate, rather than using meeting time, precious meeting time, just to find stuff out. It's also, as you know, really useful if all papers say on their front page what they want back from you, the reader. Again, it's one of those obvious things that invariably you don't see in a board paper. You either have to go to the very back of the paper to find the fundamental message and the so what of the paper and what they want from you, whether that's an approval or consideration of certain issues. You want it on page one. And we try to encourage management to ask for something back from the reader, not just because it's a decision paper. So quite often, the dynamic in the board meeting is you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of board papers get served up that are to note, huge number of papers to note. And then it's either to note or I want approval. What you ought to be encouraging in the boardroom is your advice should be asked for. Your guidance or input or experience should be sought. There may be, it may be a matter that is delegated to management, but they're preparing a paper for the board. They should get something back for it. The best boards give as much as they get, and board papers can help that. If a management report reporting on the you know, last month's financial performance were to include a question to the board, regarding, you know, we're having a bit of a challenge trying to raise this next uh, capital, uh, slug of capital. Does the board have any experience or advice to share on how we navigate some of these obstacles? That helps to engender a much better working relationship between the board and management, and it also gets more value back from the board. I'm not going to say much here other than a lot of senior members of management don't consider themselves to be expert writers. They don't consider their skill at report writing to have much to do with why they've gotten where they've gotten to. And they're often surprisingly enthusiastic and humble when the offer of 
some training is given to them to make it easier for them to prepare better papers in terms of how do you know, they know they should try to write shorter papers. They know they should try to write clearer papers. The question is how. And there are some simple tools and tips and tricks that they can learn quite quickly, quite easily, if they were only shared with them. And it's amazing how many, we run loads and loads of workshops. We offer training videos that we're bringing out as well. Um, but there's usually a huge amount of enthusiasm rather than resistance that I think we at first assumed senior people might not like the idea of training. You know, a senior director of a multinational leads an enormous division around the world may bristle at the idea of training in how to write better for the board. But to our surprise, they don't. They seem to really enjoy it. Um, finally, board portals. Uh, all I'm going to say here is, actually, how many people in the room are familiar with what I'm talking about? Board portals. OK, some. So all this is is a way of getting rid of paper from your boardroom and supplying your board papers electronically, but securely and electronically, to your board members, or to yourselves if you're the board members. So it's really a, a tool for the board secretary, the CFO, or the CEO's PA. Whoever's job it is to compile and distribute a board pack, they can now do it digitally and securely. The problem with uh, just emailing a document is it's not secure. And if you encrypt the files, you need some way of making sure that the recipient, i.e. the board members, know what the decryption key is. So board portals have emerged as a way of making that transmission process really smooth. So you have an app on your iPad or tablet device or your desktop computer, and your app receives the file when it's ready. And you get an alert to tell you your next board pack has been published. As a board member, you receive the information immediately. You don't have to wait for the courier or the postman to deliver it to you. If you're traveling around the world, it doesn't matter. You get it wherever in the world that you are. And the knowledge that's secure. If you leave your iPad or your, your computer on a train, all the data inside the app is encrypted. Your access to it can be remotely revoked and wiped. So you have peace of mind as well around information security. And it's quite a useful way of reading a board pack. If you try to read a file bigger than maybe five pages on any normal um, digital reader, you'll find it quite wearying after about page five. Flicking pages digitally is, can be quite uncomfortable. The thing about board portals, and ours is not the only one, uh, Seamus comes from the Institute of Chartered Secretaries, they sell one too. Obviously, ours is better, but uh, yeah, there are, there are others. Um, <laughs> so there, there are a number of board portal providers out there, um, and uh, it doesn't really matter which one you pick. You know, amongst two or three uh, that are, I'd say, of a similar quality for security, then it really comes down to preferences around usability um, and some of the more detailed features. But essentially, they're really nice ways of reading files. They've all got nice navigation tools that are optimized for the context of reading a board paper, annotation, search facilities, and so on. Um, ours is structured like a bookcase, so it's incredibly intuitive. Um, and you just have a little tag in green, blue, or yellow there to tell you if a pack is a new pack or if it's been updated and republished, and so on. Um, if anyone's interested, happy to tell you more. But uh, yeah, they take away, as I say, a lot of the admin burden, and there are tremendous convenience benefits to you as a board member having access to all of your board information in one place, anytime, anywhere. But they come with a health warning. The problem with board portals, making your board pack digital can hide the scale of the problem that is growing beneath. At least when you printed the damn thing out, you had the feedback of seeing quite the scale of the damage, you know, quite how big it's gotten. When you go digital, you can, more, you can feel more uh, liberal, more uh, inclined to pop in every imaginable appendix alongside every paper, and your board pack can balloon in a way that's not as obvious as when you're printing it out. So if you do go digital, keep an extra eye on the discipline around working out what does go into your board pack to make sure it remains readable to make sure you don't inadvertently create a blizzard. <laughs>